This game deserves its own legacy. Every time I watch a review for this, I have to sit through some dude comparing or contrasting every aspect of this game to the first Bioshock. Or worse, they ignore the mechanical genius and ramble on about objectivism and collectivism. Forget Anne Rand, forget the first game, I'm not a pseudo-intellectual, and this isn't an over-analysis. I'm Pliskin, and this is a breakdown of the vibes, gameplay mechanics, and set pieces of Bioshock 2. One of the most interesting bonds in gaming is that of the Big Daddy and the Little Sister. In Bioshock 2, you play as the OG Big Daddy, Subject Delta, and Eleanor is the first Little Sister. The adventure kicks off right before the Fall of Rapture, when a rising cult leader, who's also Eleanor's mom, kills you and takes Eleanor away. While a parent rescuing their child from the horrors of Rapture would usually make them the hero, let's just say that Eleanor is better off as a little sister for now. Roughly a decade later, Delta wakes up having been revived through a joint effort between Tenenbaum, who is the creator of the Little Sisters, and a much older Eleanor. This starts the tutorial level that sets up the premise of rescuing Eleanor from her megalomaniacal mother. She wants to turn Eleanor into this super being that has everyone's consciousness inside of her, and you're trying to stop that from happening and give this girl any scrap of individuality you possibly can. It's basically a custody struggle uh, between like Eleanor's mother and you, Subject Delta, and while in the game, this was always my kind of headcanon, it seemed like this was originally the premise the development team wanted to go with, as this cut dialogue here showcases that Subject Delta actually was Eleanor's father. You had been a prisoner for some time, father, and mother bought the rights to your genetic material to create me. She needed someone disposable. She didn't care who you were, because she always intended to perfect me with Adam. And she wanted me all to herself. When Mother lost me and I became a little sister, you had already been made a protector. When it came time to bond us into Pear's father, they put us all in a room and let us choose. Even in my condition, I knew I was yours. So yeah, it's, it's basically one big custody battle with you being a big daddy trying to escape Rapture and Sophia Lamb, one of the most hateable villains in all of gaming. Every moment tears Eleanor further from me, Delta. Soon, this father obsession will end her. Right off the bat, Rapture is gorgeous. It's very rare for the setting of a game to have as much presence as the characters. However, Rapture itself feels like a character. The vending machines don't feel gamey or out of place due to the city being founded on unregulated commerce. The decay of the city is so gorgeous with the barnacles and coral making its way inside, feeling like it's one with the sea. The contrast between the dark metal corridors and the bright advertisements invites you to creep along the dead hallways, searching for audio logs, weapon upgrades, and lore building details. It's as interesting and immersive of a setting as a halo ring. And like Halo, all of the facets that would normally be immersion breaking aren't because the setting makes these things feel believable. Remember when I gushed over Halo 2's potential of making the series better than ever due to the balancing potential dual wielding had to offer? Bioshock 2 takes full potential of dual wielding to make a masterpiece of balancing. Don't get me wrong, this is by no means a clean sandbox. The game is a bloated single purpose sandbox. 
Basically, for those of you that haven't been around or watched my earlier videos, single purpose games are games where each weapon or each sandbox tool that you use has a clearly defined purpose. It's not a better version of something you had before, it's that one gun for that one roll. The reason why I call it unclean is because there's a little bit of overlap here and it becomes a little muddied, but that excess kind of works in Bioshock 2's favor. This is because everything is fun to use and is viable. So there are three categories the majority of sandbox elements fall into. You have stun, which holds enemies in place or helps with crowd control. You have raw damage that of course differs in types expressed through different plasmids and ammo types that work better or worse on certain enemies. Lastly, there's traps. These are like your mini turrets, your rivet and spear traps that enemies can walk across, or bee swarms that you can hide in dead bodies. It's up to you to decide what build to go with. Do you want to use tonics and plasmids that emphasize stun effects while you stockpile on ammunition types that emphasize damage, or vice versa? So while the sandbox might have some redundancies, what puts Bioshock 2 up there with Halo CE, Snake Eater, and Breath of the Wild is the gameplay loop. The strongest comparison would be to Breath of the Wild or Snake Eater in the sense that you slowly dominate the environment by learning the ins and outs. Each level is brought to life by the Rapture ecosystem. The Rapture ecosystem is made up of splicers that antagonize the players, big daddies and little sisters that fight whenever something threatens them, and the security system that can be tamed through hacking which is streamlined and made so easy to approach through the hacking tool gun that you have in your arsenal. So this is how the gameplay loop goes. Delta gets into a certain level, it starts off as really hostile, the odds are against you, but then you go around hacking, taking down big daddies, setting up your traps, and eventually the environment works for you. So each level is a set of you conquering your environment, conquering a different slice of rapture. Or if you try to fight big daddies while security systems are sending bots to kill you and while splicers are shooting you in the back, you'll likely lose. But if you let the splicers fight the big daddy first and lure the big dude into a camera's view, a camera that you've already hacked, the little sister will be yours. Later on in the game, Alphas are thrown in to spice it up, they're kind of like Big Daddies, except they function more so like you in the sense that they can use the full scope of the sandbox, plasmids and guns, whereas the splicers, Big Daddies, and security systems from before will either be using plasmids or guns. In a lot of ways, these alpha enemies are like the Flood in Halo CE in the sense that they bring the entire sandbox and all the tips and tricks that you've been using up until this point, and they use that against you. It's a great way to bring up the challenge and make encounters more interesting, because like the Flood again, they don't have any allegiance. They'll fight the Spicers, they'll fight Big Daddies, and this game takes it even further, they'll sometimes even fight each other. They're just kind of these rage juggernauts. It's really cool. So. Every encounter, especially when the later parts of the game, when you have all these enemies there, turns into this really cool, dynamic, living, breathing battlefield. Oh. Daddy was sleeping for such a long time. The sisters are the core of the ecosystem and by extension, the gameplay loop. Aside from the morality system, which we will discuss in a moment, the little sisters serve as the primary means to get Adam, which you need to buy plasmids or tonics. Once you kill a big daddy, you can disembowel the child, adopt her, and guard her while she collects Adam from dead bodies, and you get this defensive horde mode, which is really well balanced because you have all those trap weapons and plasmids designed for that. Or you can be a Giga Chad and immediately return her to a vent for safety. I'll even pretend to give them a little nudge up when they slip during their animation of crawling back in there. But if you fuck around with enough little sisters, you'll catch the eye of a big sister. 
these are the guardians of the rapture ecosystem, and they get pissed when you disrupt the natural flow. These fights are brutal, and if you aren't prepared, you will lose. They are like faster and stronger variants of the previously discussed alpha enemy. This leads to the last type of sister, and this is the start of major spoilers, so if I've piqued your interest about Bioshock 2, go ahead and pick it up and then come back here to this video once you finish the game. But yeah, we're gonna start getting to nitty gritty elements and stuff like that. The set piece sister is the last category of sister type. Things. Enemies? I mean, big sisters are enemies, but little sisters aren't, I don't know. The set piece sister comes in two forms, and both are designed to spice up the basic ecosystem gameplay loop. The playable little sister embodies the consciousness transfer that the game is constantly talking about happening throughout the game, and it gives you a physical example of how it works. So through Adam, you are able to transfer into the consciousness of this little sister and control her. Here you get a simple gimmicky section where you crawl through vents, collect Adam, and get a physical understanding of the morality system in play. The second set piece sister is Eleanor, who fights alongside you in the final level of Inner Persephone. I have a lot to say about Eleanor in this spot, however before we can really discuss and analyze her role in the game, we gotta start talking about the morality system. Bioshock 2 is a game all about choice. Your choices in the ecosystem affect your role in it. Your choices in tonics affect your build. And your in-game moral choices have an influence on your Eleanor. There are two influencers on Eleanor. What you do to the sisters and what you do to the lieutenants. Sparing the sisters teaches her the value of innocence and protecting that innocent life. Sparing the lieutenants of her mother teaches the value of forgiveness. Consuming the sisters teaches her the value of selfishness in regards to gaining power and surviving. Killing the lieutenants teaches her the values of justice and crime and punishment. There are many variables that can influence three basic endings, but then there's multiple variants of said endings, so there's really four or five. Your choices really do matter here. So for example, I always save the sisters and kill the lieutenants. So I initially get a darker ending where Eleanor kills her mother in the name of justice because that's the example I set for her. But then later I get the lighter swing at the end where the little sisters are saved and Eleanor takes my consciousness into her own to guide her to do good in the world. So there's dark, there's light, there's moral grayness, and the game adapts around your morally gray decision. It's a very personalized experience that bleeds into the elements in the game, specifically Eleanor. She is the physical embodiment of your decision-making process. Her in-game behavior, dialogue, and appearance when you fight alongside her in the final level are all influenced by what you've been doing up until that point. They influence her because she's using your behavior, your actions, as an example for how she should be. I am not your bloody messiah! Oh, the girls remember you! We all remember. Stay away from my father! And rapture drowns! Think of me dancing in the sun! Everyone else has been reborn! They left you behind! You can only die once! But I promise to make it funny! All these choices are made in-game, and they almost always have an element of moral grayness. This is another reason why the game is so great. In-game decisions that have variables in the ending and a physical manifestation of your choices in the form of Eleanor. This is a much deeper morality system than we usually get, especially for the time, considering this game came out in the time of make the red choice or make the blue choice. Bioshock 2 offers a one-of-a-kind experience combination of elemental gameplay, in-depth sandbox interactions, a living ecosystem for you to play with, and an in-game morality system that branches out into endings that showcase the dark and light of your choices. It has a hateable villain and lovable allies. 
and an iconic, beautiful, immersive setting. It was one of my favorite games as a kid and still stands strong when I revisit it as a man. This is so much more than the game that released between Bioshock 1 and Infinite, and it deserves its own legacy. I glossed over the story and specific sandbox elements here because I wanted to do a more generalized review. But I'll probably be talking about this game in the future, probably alongside other games, but for now I felt like it really deserved its own video, and this is a game that's really special to me and close to my heart, so... Yeah, I always viewed this channel as sharing, you know, parts of myself and what I like, so my Christmas gift to you guys is a recommendation of a game that, if you haven't played up until this point, you really should. Merry Christmas. Hope you guys are doing okay. Over and out. This is Solid Snake. Hey, subscribe to Pliskin Boy. God damn it. You heard him. <laughs>